Thank you, Mike. That was the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I know some of you are sad this morning because this is the final sermon of my 2022 sermon series, Jesus in the Movies. I hope you guys have enjoyed it as much as I have. And I don't think many of you have. I know it's been kind of <laughs> annoying to have to watch the movies. But just remember, if you didn't enjoy it, I only did 11. So don't make me angry in the new year. I might do another one. There's still one more out there. I couldn't come up with an idea, but I'll think about it some more. Maybe uh, we'll do one more in the new year. We'll see. <laughs> Now, like I said, I, hope so. I know some of you didn't like having to watch the movies, but this movie that we're talking about today, A Christmas Carol, specifically the 1984 version starring George Scott and Scrooge, you didn't need to watch because everybody knows this story. I still remember watching an animated version of this story when I was younger featuring the character Scrooge McDuck. He's actually Donald Duck's uncle. I don't know if y'all remember that. But Scrooge McDuck is featured in an animated version of A Christmas Carol. And at Christmas time, if somebody's being a grump, you either call them one of two things, right? One is Scrooge, and the other is the Grinch. Like those are the two characters of evil at Christmas time that we all know about. You might call him Scrooge McDuck, too. I still call somebody and say, you're, you're being a Scrooge McDuck right now. Now, you could argue that this movie is not a Christian story, but if you were to say that to me, I would say, bah humbug. <laughs> because I, partic I picked this particular version, the 1984 version, because I think it explicitly is Christian. And despite some of the corny dialogue, I'll emphasize one line you may have noticed. Oh, I was making merry yesterday. That's what they say. I'm going to make merry. I, just, I guess that's a particular British phrase uh, that I don't get. But there are some great scenes in this movie and some uh, particular dialogue that I want to emphasize today when we talk about the story and how it relates to our scripture lesson today. Now, when we meet the character of Scrooge, he is very similar to the rich man in our scripture lesson today. He uh, at least uh, sees the poor, unlike the rich man in the character who never even saw Lazarus, but he chastises them like he did to Tiny Tim at the beginning of the movie. He says, don't beg out here, boy. And he assumes the very worst about the poor. He assumes that they're lazy, they're only looking for handouts, they should just use the services that the government provides for them, the poorhouses, as he calls them. And in a terrible scene of dialogue, when two people try to uh, solicit money from him for the poor, he says, well, if they die, it's just population control. The most heartless thing anybody could actually say, could say, and the people are so shocked by it, they say, surely you don't mean that. And he says, with all my heart. So that shows you what kind of character we're dealing with here. And on Christmas Eve, he meets the spirit of Jacob Marley, who we learn is his prior business partner who died seven years prior to that. We're told by Bob Cratchit on Christmas Eve he died. And uh, some of y'all may have noticed that when we first see the very corny special effects in this movie of Jake Marley's face appearing. What's in the background when his face appears? Did anybody notice that it was a mural of the Last Supper? He appears over Jesus' face in the Last Supper. I see some heads nodding. Maybe some of you all notice that. Now, Jacob is weighed down by boxes and chains that he carries on his body, and he warns Scrooge that this is what happened to him for caring too much about work and things that were not important. It's a very symbolic uh, image, not only of his sins, but what was really important to him when he was alive. These boxes of 
money, or I don't really know what Scrooge does. He, he counts commodities or trades commodities, He's like a stockbroker, I guess. But these boxes full of stuff. It's stuff that he accumulated and he cared more about during his lifetime than what was really important. I think as a side note here, I'm going to say that I don't think Jacob Marley is necessarily in hell, but it'd be something like the Catholic idea of purgatory. He mentions to Scrooge that he is appearing to Scrooge as part of penance. He says, as part of my penance, I'm appearing to you. So that's the idea that you know maybe he's been sentenced by God to have to do some things to pay off his life of sin. That's another sermon for another day on purgatory and what the scriptural basis for that would be. But I just wanted to mention that as a side note. Now, a very important scene of dialogue here is when uh, Marley says to Scrooge, when I was alive, I never left this counting house. And Scrooge says, yeah, that was true. You were really good at business. And then, I'm not going to do the impression, but it sounds something like this. Business? And then he says, mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Now that was very profound to me because it struck me as that being those things are the business of Christians as well. That's what our business should be as Christians. The good of mankind, the common welfare, charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence. You could kind of sum those things up in words that Jesus said, loving our neighbors as ourselves. That kind of summarizes all those things. But it's also important because I think uh, I mean, we have some folks that are retired here, but I'll say just speaking from personal experience, I'm very susceptible to making my job and what I do for a living more important than other things in my life that I shouldn't uh, make important. The dealings of my trade seem important to me today. They'll seem important to me when I go to work next week and say, am I going to win this case? Am, or how's this trial going to go? But as Jacob Marley says, the dealings of his trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of our whole lives. I would hope that when we look back at the end of our lives, we'll say, you know, oh, you know, you'll th focus on important things. Was I a good Christian, a good father, brother, sister, uh, friend? And you're not going to say, did I get that achievement at work? Did I get those extra billable hours in? Did I get whatever it is you do for a living? I would hope that you would look at it like Jacob Marley and say, those were just a drop in the ocean of what? The overall meaning of my life was. Now we know that Scrooge is very much like Jacob Marley and that he hasn't realized that all of his counting house deals and uh, business is a small drop in the barrel of what's really important in his life. So he has to meet with three ghosts. The ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Now, the one thing I'll, I won't tell and really go through all of what's revealed in each of these ghosts, but I'll focus on a couple of things. The thing that was most noteworthy to me about the ghost of Christmas past is we learned that Scrooge and his father do not have a good relationship. Scrooge is constantly trying to get the approval of his father, and his father doesn't like him because Scrooge... Uh, when he was being born, his mother died in childbirth. That's not a very good reason not to like your son, but for whatever reason, that's his father's attitude towards him. And Scrooge is constantly trying to live up to his father's expectations and to really have his father love him. And I think that's a great representation of not only Christians, but human beings in general. We are all estranged 
from our Heavenly Father. From the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, we have fallen away from God and we have let sin enter our lives and there's kind of a chasm between us. What we're trying to be, to be more like God and where we actually are, being our sinful selves. And there's a bridge, a way to get across that chasm. And it's the only way across that chasm. And that is Jesus Christ. So I really like that image of Scrooge longing for his father's approval because I long for my heavenly father's approval. And I hope we all do as well. We're here at church, so I think we do. And we need to, we're, we're going to fall short of that approval, but it's okay because Jesus gives us a way across that chasm of forgiveness of sins that gets us right with God if we would just call on his name. So that is one thing I thought was significant about the ghost of Christmas past. Also, for the gentlemen out there, if your girlfriend comes to you and says, would you still love me if I didn't have any money? Yes! You should say yes. Well, you shouldn't say what Kurt Scrooge does. I don't know. How would I know that? I mean, I don't know if y'all thought it was funny. Yeah. I did. It was like, oh, you, he's, he was not very smart in that scene. Anyways, uh, the ghost of Christmas present comes next. And he shows Scrooge, Bob Cratchit's family, what they're doing on Christmas. Shows him his nephew, Fred, and the Christmas party he's having. But most importantly, he shows us the poor of London who Scrooge was looking down upon and saying such terrible things about earlier in the movie and shows us that they're really just folks who are just trying to make it in the world. Now, one line I wanted to focus on was when he goes to Bob, sorry, when he goes to Bob Cratchit's house, Bob and Tim have just come back from church and his wife asks him, how was church? And his father says, I think Tim is growing and getting stronger every day. He says, he's glad that everybody can see him struggling to walk at church because it reminds them of the one who made cripples walk and let blind men see. I got a little teary-eyed at that moment. That's, that's an awesome scene of dialogue to me. But that's, you know, kind of the, the upbeat portion of the Ghost of Christmas Present. It gets really sad and uh, serious when the Ghost of Christmas Present takes Scrooge to the scene of the poor under the bridge. And he shows Scrooge two emaciated-looking children, and he says, these children are named Ignorance and Want. I had to think about that. I think I know what ignorance means, but I was like, want? What? It's just a particular word for him to abuse. So let's analyze that a little bit. He doesn't really say much about them other than to say they are, Scrooge says, who are these children? And he says, they are your children. They are the children of all who walk the earth. Now Scrooge, of course, doesn't have children. He ruined things with his potential love in, in the past that we see because uh, he put his work and money above her. But he says they're everyone's children. They're God's children. And he says, written on their brow is the word doom. And they are the downfall of all who deny their existence. This part really made me think of our scripture lesson today. The rich man in the scripture lesson was ignorant of Lazarus and his suffering. He didn't realize that Lazarus was in want. He was in need of something. That's what I think the want means. You're ignorant of somebody else being in want of something, being in need of something. He was ignorant to the suffering that was going on just outside of his gate, that he needed food and he needed medical care. Now, y'all might remember James Friday filled in for me in the pulpit not long ago, and he preached on this passage already. And I talked with James beforehand, and he told me exactly what he was going to preach about on this passage. And he said the operative word in this passage is see. The rich man saw Lazarus only when it was too late. In his life, when he could actually have done something about it, he did not see Lazarus. He passed by him every day. 
He only saw Lazarus and Abraham when it was too late. So the warning in A Christmas Carol is very similar to this. It's do not be ignorant of the suffering and want around you. Acknowledge it, first, first of all, but more importantly, do something about it. Do whatever you can, whatever resources at your disposal to help alleviate and ease the suffering around you. In other words, you should love the least of your brothers and sisters because in doing so is the same as if you love and take care of Jesus Christ himself. Now finally, this one is one uh, this is the scary part of the story, I guess. But it is kind of funny, the, the corny sound effect. Every time he doesn't say anything, he just points, and it plays that screeching sound. The ghost of Christmas yet to come. This is Scrooge's moment as the rich man. He sees the error of his ways in this moment. He's a little slow. I mean, I thought it was pretty obvious that Scrooge is the, the dead guy here. And he's like, who is this guy? Who is the guy? I'm like, come on, man, put two and two together. It's not that hard. Y'all can laugh at that. Uh, but unlike the rich man, Scrooge gets a chance to change his ways. You could say this, you know, ghost of Christmas uh, of yet to come is like, he looks like the Grim Reaper. He's this big, tall character with a hood. It's like he's seeing somebody from the dead. We learn from our scripture, um, the rich man says, but if my brothers see somebody come back from the dead, then they will change their ways. Scrooge does see someone from the dead here, and he repents. The rich man says, if my brothers see someone from the dead, they will repent. And Scrooge does what the brothers and anybody, any Christian, any human should do. Because we've seen someone from the dead. We've seen Jesus Christ raised from the dead. That's the, uh, what our scripture means when he says, Abraham says, Then if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now this is foreshadowing because Jesus hasn't died yet. But he's foreshadowing his death here. And we as Christians now, looking back on it, have the benefit of seeing he's talking about himself here. When he rises from the dead, we should believe, just as people before then should have believed in Moses and the prophets. This year was the first year Charlotte was really excited on Christmas. She had that childlike wonder of the holiday where she asked about Santa and when he was coming and about the reindeer um, and would they make noise when they landed on the roof, that kind of thing. Scrooge wakes up on Christmas morning and he's very happy. He's like a kid on Christmas morning. I think he actually even says that he's as giddy as a schoolboy. He goes crazy and starts jumping on his bed. And it's a reminder to me of our call to worship this morning. It's why I chose that verse. Not only does Jesus love children, as he says in Mark chapter 10, but he says that anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. This reminds me of Tiny Tim's prayer when the ghost of Christmas present comes to visit, and Scrooge comes to visit him. And uh, Bob Cratchit, when he prays and says grace, he says, Merry Christmas to all. And Tim says, And God bless us, everyone. Now, Tim doesn't fret about his current circumstances. He's happy with what they have, even though they don't have a lot. And he knows, ultimately, that better things are to come. Like Bob said, when Tim struggles to walk through church and others see him, they know that there is someone who can make lame men walk and blind men see. He knows that there is a better, more complete life ahead in God's heavenly kingdom. He looks at things simply and doesn't let the worries of life, the finances of his father, their lowly status in society get him down. He keeps his mind on heavenly things. And he knows simple things about love. Love from his parents. Love from his brothers and sisters. That's a little bit of what it means, I think, to look at the kingdom of God like a little child does. 
So in 2023, let's make it our goal. I'm not going to say New Year's resolution because those are always broken. Let's make it our goal to not be ignorant of our neighbor's suffering and want, to be thankful for what we have, and may God bless us all, everyone, in 2023. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.